Welcome to One Word Stories. My name is Joanna Zell and I'm tremendously happy to host a very special guest today. My guest today is uh, Helen Spencer Oti, uh, who is from Great Britain. Uh, she is the managing director of the Global People Consulting and uh, also the emeritus professor from the Warwick University, where she was the chair of the Intercultural Communication. An author of many fascinating books, Intercultural Politeness, and also her very, very recent publication, The Global Fitness for Global People, together with Peter Franklin and Domna Lazidou. Helen, a very warm welcome. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure. Thank you for inviting me to participate. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, the book, uh, especially the title, triggered lots of my curiosity. And when it arrived, I was really in the seventh heaven, so to say, <laughs> because I saw a fantastic example how it's possible to combine the subjective um, interpretation of the surrounding world in stories, in critical incidents, case studies, you mm -hmm. name it together with academic approach. So it's a fantastic mixture of, so to say, both words. And you almost always start with the story, with the example, and then uh, behave a little bit like free detectives and have a look, a, a close up at the story and say, oh, wow, how can we actually learn from it and put it to the next level so from this micro perspective to the macro micro micro one and uh, how we can debrief it where did this idea come from i suppose it actually came from my own personal experience when i was um 21 i went out to hong kong um, and I didn't really know anything much about the Chinese culture. Well, I knew nothing. That's, that's my British understatement. And um, immediately I came up against various experiences. So uh, one that had quite a deep impression on me was I went um, to the bank to, I don't know, get some money or something. And I did the transaction with the with the clerk, and it was sort of around midday. So he was a young man, maybe in his mid twenties. You know, I would say 20, 21. And he he said to me, "Have you had lunch?" Mm -hmm. And I was really surprised. I thought, you know, because in England this means, might you like to go and have lunch together? So I thought, well, that's really strange. So I said, uh, oh, yeah, yes, I've had lunch. That was that. And then I went on to uh, the school where I was going. And um, as I was walking in, one of the teachers said, um, have you had lunch? And I said, um, it was probably completely inappropriate. I said, well, of course. Why would I come to school without having lunch? And then over the next days, weeks, because you know, this was right at the beginning of my time in Hong Kong, I found everybody's asking me the same question. Mm -hmm. So this caused me a lot of reflection. You know, why are they all asking me this same question? So I came to the conclusion, because at that time I was really very thin. I thought they must be worried that I'm not eating well enough. <laughs> And of course, later I found out that it was just a greeting, like we say, lovely weather. And so in Hong Kong and then later in Shanghai, it was these very um, personal, you could say, individual experiences that were causing me to reflect on the whole issue of culture and communication. Up to that point, it I'd never thought about it at all. It wasn't, um, I hadn't studied it. Um, and so I think for me, that has always, that has been the foundation. And um, it was how I came into the whole field was through my concrete experiences, you could say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. 
So uh, when I listen to your story, I immediately picture the situation, you know, <laughs> uh, a skinny girl from Europe or young woman from Europe <laughs> interpreting yes. something from her perspective. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. And uh, this is also something that uh, exactly uh, is part of your book that after such a story you give not only the explanation what actually happened on both sides but also you deliver certain tools how yes. to better understand it and when I listened to you it was really this uh, idea of really deep reflection yes. so first of all to report mm -hmm. what actually happened and uh, this is the story actually yeah. uh, who was there where it happened and uh, what actually was uh, maybe part of the misunderstanding part of the challenge there must be a challenge if there is no challenge there is no story and then the second step is the reflection yes. what is actually happening when we when we have the reflection, because what uh, we are heading toward is actually one of the tools you introduce in your book uh, that gives a really big picture how we can make sense of the stories we have heard. That's right. And I think um, <clears throat> one of the things that I noticed a lot in in this whole intercultural ex experience was that um, we often react in, a, in, in an emotional way. Mm. Um, sometimes it's surprise and confusion, but sometimes it might be annoyance or, it, um, you know, or some other thing. And so um, actually that first step of reporting is in fact more difficult than it might seem because my experience is that um, very often we mix in our emotions and also our judgments of the other person um, into um, into the story as mm -hmm. it were um, and I could give you another example when I was teaching a few a few years ago um, and I'd done a lecture and then the students had a 10 minute break and then some of them were coming back for a workshop. And one of the um, students, um, an international student, Korean, but it could have been any nationality really. Um, as she came into the classroom, she said, um, I'm so annoyed, I don't think I can um, take the class today. Mm. So I was completely taken by surprise and I said oh why so she said well your office staff have just been really rude to me when I handed in my assignment and I thought well that's surprising you know um, so anyway we used the class I gave up what I was going to do and to use as we call it the 3R tool to unpack because they were taking a course in intercultural communication mm -hmm. and, and to train them. I should say when I went out of the class, the office staff said to me, your student was really rude to us today. And so here you've got two sides, if you want to call it like that, mm -hmm. both with emotional reactions, but also making negative judgments of each other. Both were saying, the other was rude mm -hmm. so um you've got sort of two things that we have to be careful about which is what we try to deal with with the three r when you have this upsetting annoying uh, whatever you know surprising experience you've got the emotion that needs to be handled and you've got the judgment that should be fair rather than unfair mm -hmm. And so the three R is meant to help people deal with both of those aspects. Now, um, step one, yes, report is, is saying, try to be objective now. Don't add in judgments of the other person. 
what exactly happened. Mm -hmm. That in itself can help to lower the emotion. But we also ask them to say, then what emotions did you actually experience? Mm -hmm. So to, to write that down, and all the psychological research shows that if you identify emotions and ideally even write them down, that in itself is part of a, you could say, a healing process. Yeah. So step one is very much is its report, but it's not just, oh, that's that's the factual bit that in itself has key value. Then we would say, oh, OK, yes, we also have, want to say who was involved and where did it take place, etc., because that's also important information for interpreting. So the next step, yes, as you said, is then to reflect, um, which is to try and think through. And, and what I found is if you just say to people, reflect, well, what are they going to reflect on? They don't mm. always they don't always know so you know it is one of the the reasons one of the factors is why was i upset or why was i annoyed what what was wrong about what the other person did that i see as being wrong and so in my rapport management framework which i can't really talk about too much now it would be to um help people go through there are a number of sensitivities so you know i've talked about um goals so if if my i have one goal and somebody else has prevented me from achieving that goal i will feel annoyed hmm. or another one would be face so yeah. If somebody says something that I feel has uh, sort of damaged my reputation or they've criticized me or something, and then I will lose lose face, that will um, upset me. So there are a number of things like that, which it, I'm currently working on another book, actually, where I'm talking about that, um, that people can actually think through systematically how much was this then sometimes they're interconnected it's not either or you know um was it fair or was i treated unfairly you know was was my face threatened or and so on was i controlled too much yeah um was my goal hampered so these are kind of um we call them like rapport sensitive factors that if they are um not managed in a way that i want mm. i will feel hurt or upset but of course how i see things may not be the same as how the other person sees things so then when you're reflecting you first reflect on from your own perspective but then a very important thing is to try and see things from the other person's perspective for example were their goals different mm -hmm. um or um say for example if it was a meeting did and you know i wasn't allowed to speak for instance um when i wanted to say something are the rules for managing meetings different yeah mm -hmm. so it's obviously difficult always to see things from the other perspective so we would encourage people to ask somebody else for advice especially if they're more familiar with that particular context so that then once you begin to see oh well maybe their goals were different or maybe their their sort of norms for managing meetings were different then you begin to see well i had my perspective but they had their perspective and then that brings you to the third stage, reevaluate, where you can see, OK, actually, you know, it wasn't they weren't just being rude. They were perhaps doing things um, in their own way. Exactly. 
exactly so this re-evaluation is actually one of the most important steps Absolutely. to reconcile this uh, dilemmas these two sides yes yes exactly mm -hmm. i mean clearly you know sometimes um the other person is being unreasonable mm -hmm. um so that's not to say this will solve all problems but it brings clarification um of the issues and very often it is just different perspectives which you need to um just become aware of yeah yeah so actually it uh, reminds me uh, quite uh, uh, of other tools in our field so to say when i think of describe interpret evaluate uh, yes yeah. so the high e model by janet and uh, milton bennett by the yeah. way milton was also my my yeah. guest uh, in uh, one word stories uh, however we didn't uh, talk about this model we talked more about his developmental model of intercultural sensitivity but also all these yeah so observe yeah, yeah. describe interpret suspend evaluation so also yes. It goes uh, in the similar direction by uh, Stella Think to Me. Yes, exactly. Also, the tool by Darla Dadov uh, and Kate Berardo. Exactly. And it, it's not unique, but I think what we've tried to do to a certain extent in the book, and also what I'm working on now, is to give more guidance over the elements to reflect on. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think everybody agrees in those basic sort of steps, we might call them something different, but everybody agrees the importance of reflection. But um, I mean, actually, somebody in business was saying to me the other day, we just don't know what to reflect on. Exactly. And this is also something that uh, got suspended from the business world. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, uh, one of the most common questions I get is what is the difference between a story and the case study or right. and the critical incident? And actually, of course, these are descriptions of situations. Nevertheless, uh, in a story, very, very often the emotions are really addressed literally. In case studies, uh, sometimes we need to, uh, so to say, reflect upon what actually happened uh, at the emotional layer, uh, given only this uh, pretty dry description. Yeah. Yes, yes. I mean, it's an interesting thing. I don't know whether in other languages it's different. I mean, in our book, we agonized quite a bit over whether to call them case studies, stories, or mm -hmm. what to call them. Yeah, yeah. Because case study sounds a bit more as though it should be like if I'm doing a piece of academic research and I use a case study approach. But story in English, a lot of people think it means it didn't really happen. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's so once it's, upon a time. <laughs> once upon a time. Um, but again, you know, storytelling has also come around in in a, in research methodology. Now it's yeah. also an accepted one. But um, if you are trying to to reach a, a a professional audience, sometimes who are not familiar with <clears throat> our kind of field and so on, yeah. they might think, "Oh, story, it didn't really happen." Mm. And I think um, <clears throat> one of my complaints, as it were of many intercultural books is that I'll call them the examples they use are not actually authentic. Mm. Um, and so, especially if they're looking at the communication, you can look at it and, and see immediately that didn't really happen exactly mm. like that. Mm. And then I think the problem with that is that when people really experience things it's more complex than yeah. than the book has implied um so one of the fundamental principles we had for our book was that all the stories case studies what we want to actually happened they were you know they're all ones that um we'd experienced or reliable people had told us about and so on yeah yeah 
Yeah, and what was also fascinating was that you added also one chapter with the importance of the influence of the context, so also the organizational culture and uh, the, the system <clears throat> where this uh, incident takes place. Yes. This is also pretty, pretty often neglected. Yes. Or it's not given as much importance as it should be given. Mm. And uh, what I really liked and appreciated a lot was one more tool, uh, also additionally to your three R's, the SOS. It sounds like <laughs> uh, calling for help. Yes. <laughs> how, how do you yes. refer to this tool? <laughs> yes. So, I mean, I'll make a first a comment on what you just said about the, the, the context, because um, for me, context is, is vital. I mean, it, at multiple levels, it's vital for interpreting, um, you know, whether it's the three R thing or the SOS, the stories, you have to understand the context and communication is, is really influenced by the context. But context can be seen at that interactional level. We'll come back to that in a minute with the SOS. But there's also, as you go out, you have the organizational context, yeah. you've got the broader socio-cultural context, et cetera. And what I found, again, um, whether I think it's in, in companies or, or in universities, that very often, shall I say, the senior management point the finger at individuals. Mm -hmm. So it could be, um, Oh, students, you know, they haven't worked hard that uh, hard enough. That's why they aren't globally competent or something, global graduates. Um, or else it's, oh, the teaching staff haven't done a good enough job. It's their fault. Mm. You know, or the trainer. Oh, the trainer we got wasn't good enough. Yeah. Um, and the the problem with that is is sort of just saying is not seeing that all these things are interconnected you know that a, a student is supported by teachers but teachers are supported by the whole environment that they are in as well as students and so all all parties have a responsibility to foster uh, skills, whatever skills you're talking about. Um, so that's why we wanted to have that third part, which is very much um, on on the the environmental context, the organisation. If you're in the con in the organisation, but also the broader context that people are, the society that people are functioning in. So going back to the the SOS, yes. So the the um, 3R is really just saying to help you make sense of and calm down from situations. But it's not asking you, well, what are you going to do or how are you going to change? Mm -hmm. And so the SOS um, is actually really saying, um, OK, you you've gone somewhere where you need to make some change to your own behavior um how are you going to do that and um <clears throat> some of that is is inspired really by um andy malinsky's work mm -hmm. with the notion of um uh, his notion many people have of, of the comfort zone yeah um but what i think um, is important here is we can't necessarily change our behavior overnight mm, it's a process it's a process mm. and you know we've we've spent all of our life so far maybe doing it in one way to change is not that easy mm. um and so that notion of stretching, so the third S is, is to stretch, to kind of not change yourself into a completely different person. You know, so he, Andy has that sort of notion of, um, you know, the, the sort of normal pattern in one group, but a normal pattern in another group. But within the, uh, each group, there's a lot of variation. So you exactly. just need to need to stretch a little bit 
to get close enough, as mm -hmm. it were, to not upset um, upset the others. So it's really a question of, you know, so what it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of studying the other behavior, observing it, stretching and, you know, then looking again, observing again, and then stretching a bit more um, until you have been able to stretch enough mm. to, um, to make others feel comfortable, as it were. I mean, again, if I give an example, when I was, um, I, I spent a lot of time working with China, as, uh, both in China, but also after I came back, uh, uh, working at Warwick, um, had to do a lot of um, partnership work, and I was managing some, some projects. And um, I found that Britain, I don't know about, your other listeners, but Britain has become increasingly informal. Mm -hmm. And often the things in China were very formal. Yeah. And so um, I found it quite difficult to be as formal mm. as the partners wanted me to be. Um, so if we'd had um, a visit from some partners you know I might just say at the end oh it was it was great to see you all that's really lovely hope you have a good trip back but that was not formal enough yeah yeah so you know I was having to learn to stand up and say now I'm going to make a speech and and um and be much more formal which I was quite uncomfortable with mm. um but and I could never become as formal as maybe some of, of uh, the, the, the partners, but it's a question of, of stretching a bit. Yes, it's a question of stretching exactly and also authenticity. Yeah. Yes. How do I feel in this situation? You have just addressed it that it costs us lots of energy. Yes. Yeah? So the mental energy. Exactly. And I think there again, you know, it's it's thinking of um, when you think of authenticity, there's various aspects, you know, there, there is the um, actually how competent do I feel to, yeah. to do it in this way? Mm. Um, so, for instance, in Britain, when you're in negotiations, um, I might say a sentence or two, and then you might say a sentence or two, and it's to and fro. Now, in China... The person could speak for five minutes, ten minutes, and only then could you give your response. Mm. And then you've kind of almost forgotten what they said at the beginning, whereas they had a whole group of people taking notes and writing it yeah. all down to support them, whereas just me there. Um, so that was a kind of competence mm. issue for me. Mm. So, and then sometimes it's a kind of face issue, you know, um, as you say, a kind of identity. This doesn't feel like me. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's resentment. Why do I have to change? Why don't they change a bit more? Yeah. Um, so there's a whole lot of emotions, as you say, that we have to sort of work through so that we can make do that stretching and still be comfortable in ourselves. Exactly. So this is exactly this call for help, which you called SOS. Yes. <laughs> How does it work when, when people listen to us? What can they imagine that, for example, they have such a situation and they don't really understand uh, what, uh, what actually happened, why people behave this way. Maybe they have applied this three hours already in the best case. Nevertheless, uh, what are the steps in the SOS? How can they proceed from there? Yeah, and I mean, again, I'll give you an example. I set this actually as a little task for uh, the students on mm -hmm. my course where they could pick any um, piece of behavior that they um, 
felt uncomfortable with, mm -hmm. but um, they felt was professionally important for them to actually um, learn to adapt. And um, I was interested that quite a number of my students chose greetings. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody uses greetings. Yeah. But how people do greetings can be very, very variable. Um, and so there were all kinds of, so these are, you know, that, yes, as you say, these sort of incidents where you had, you know, some saying, I really wanted to, uh, when we'd done teamwork, I wanted to give them a hug and, and, and a kiss when we were, when we met or going by, but they were kind of felt really uncomfortable yeah. with that, yeah. but I was uncomfortable, you know, et cetera. How do I deal with this? And and then one example of one poor student, um, she came into the room and uh, this was a Chinese student and um, one of the British students said to her, you're right. And in English now, that's just a greeting. Mm -hmm. It's like, have you had lunch? No, no meaning. Yeah. yeah. Um, and but she was like me with the have you had lunch? She was, oh, why are they asking me? Mm. Are you all right? I must be looking ill. Yeah. And yeah. she spent the whole class. Of course, I didn't know because I was just teaching, you know, and um, spent the whole class worrying what was wrong with her. Mm. She went back to her accommodation on campus at lunchtime. And then she never came back to class in the afternoon. Um, and then later when I saw her, the, you know, she wrote all this up and submitted it. And I thought, oh, goodness me. Um, so she realized, and that other students were saying the same thing, greetings, if you don't get them right, mm -hmm. you, you never form relationships because people are, are put off. So what they did then was to actually, what she did and others, was to watch very carefully um, how other people were doing greetings, what exactly they, they said. And if, especially they found it difficult how to carry on the greeting. So if you say, how are you? Oh, fine, how are you? That's the end of the conversation. Mm. So they were then watching what did other people do to sort of keep the conversation going. So that's the observe part of the SOS. Mm -hmm. And then they would try out. So when they observed certain phrases or certain techniques, they would then try that out. They would try and watch the reaction. Did it go well? Did the conversation keep going? Or did they feel uncomfortable, awkward? And then, um, so it would be a lot of trial and error and gradually stretching until they actually felt comfortable doing the greetings in a different way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, when, uh, when I listen to your description of the SOS, so study, observe, stretch again, yeah, we've got this uh, last step, uh, the concentrating on this uh, emotional state mm -hmm. so uh, how can i actually stretch and i'm really uh, happy you uh, also referred to andy molinsky who by the way was also my guest uh, yeah. here in one word stories when he talked about uh, exactly this uh, the skill actually that can be trained we yes. can train stretching and uh, we can train, um, so to say, expanding our comfort zone. Yeah, Absolutely. not leaving it, but expanding it. Exactly. Really exactly. A new uh, fan of uh, behaviors, and also with time, feeling authentic in this uh, exactly. new uh, setting as well. Absolutely. I think there's also a sense of. Um, Fit. There's a sort of psychological concept of, of um, fitting. And this is people sometimes misinterpret fitting in as meaning I have to change to be yeah. like them. But, um, you know, like with any fitting, it's 
both sides, you know, um, you all have to sort of fit and adjust to each other. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think in multiple ways, um, that's why we chose the term global fitness. Yeah, yeah, thank you for sharing. <laughs> So um, again, when I listen to you and when you also address this uh, idea of fitting in, yes, mm -hmm. one has to not necessarily uh, adapt on, only from one side, but uh, it's required from both uh, counterparts mm -hmm. or many, yeah. many counterparts in, in different settings. Uh, in many situations, these people are dealing with huge stress. Yeah, so also... Again, what we have uh, emphasized at the very beginning, the organizational uh, culture can play a very important role also socio-cultural uh, setting and so on and so forth. And uh, this brings me to the question, uh, when there are such turbulent times, when there is something really, really triggering uh, you personally, what is the word that actually helps you personally to go through such a tough period? And what is the story behind? Yeah, I mean, I don't know whether it's just one. I mean, I think maybe you could say turbulence if we reinterpret it as novelty. And... Um, Novelty, we have the opportunity to respond to in two ways. One is to get frightened and all that uncertainty that you're talking about. But the other is to um, see it as an opportunity to learn new things and to and to grow. Um, and I was actually listening on the radio this morning to um, they were interviewing an Australian who had gone uh, on, a, had sailed across the Pacific um, on her own. And there were tremendous, there were whole kinds of things, storms and a shark and all kinds of things. And she was basically saying, and I think this is the same for me, you know, that you say to yourself, this will pass. Mm -hmm. So it's having that hope that this is not permanent, it will pass. And meanwhile, how do you get through that novelty when it's, you know, is to turn it from the negative uncertainty, but to actually see it as um, a positive for learning. And so she was saying every day, she would be thinking of, the positive things that had happened, the good things. And that, I think, I still find that um, very important for myself. Every evening is just to reflect, um, yes, okay, what's been difficult, but what's been good, so that that novelty, you are not looking at it with fear and uncertainty, but actually turning it to um, a learning experience. Um, that you can actually be grateful for. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fantastic uh, last words <laughs> in our conversation. It's a beautiful closing. I'm very, very grateful uh, for your insights because, again, it gives a much, much different perspective and this perspective change and also this openness uh, to, let's say, re-evaluating different situations is, as you say, a big, big gift. So uh, it's so much about feeling grateful for this opportunity also, not only in the cultural context, but also in life in general. Exactly. Thank you, Helen. Thank you very much for well, accepting my invitation. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. Thanks.